My apologies, everybody. How could I do that after so much uh, team flexibility today? My apologies. I thought I'd uh, taken that off. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much, everybody, everybody for, joining for joining us for this, this keynote. keynote. Welcome, Welcome back, back from your lunch, lunch break, break if you, if you, you had, had one, if you had something good, good but that, that you're not feeling too sleepy after lunch, after lunch which sometimes happens. happens. So, welcome so welcome back, back and, and thank, thank you, you again, again to everyone who's behind, behind the, the, the camera, camera, behind the scenes today, helping to make sure all of these events work really nicely. So I'm delighted to welcome Stephen Downs to give a keynote. We originally invited Stephen to give a keynote for us in 2020, but I don't want to say what happened to that, so it's been a long, a long wait for us to finally hear from him, and I'm very pleased he's able to join us today. So Stephen works at the Digital Technologies Research Centre at the National Research Council of Canada, specialising in new instruction and media and personal learning technology. He's one of the originators of the first massive online open course, or MOOC, and has, and has published, published frequently, frequently about, about learning, learning, online learning, and network, network learning. learning. He's authored learning, learning, learning management and content syndication software, and is the author of the widely read e-learning e e newsletter, Our Daily. Daily. Throughout, Throughout his 35-year career, career, Stephen, Stephen has conducted, conducted pioneering, pioneering work in the fields of online, online learning, learning, games learning, learning, learning objects, objects and metadata, metadata, podcasting, and open educational resources. In this, in this keynote, keynote today, today Stephen draws on his, his, on his, on his experience and coverage of stories of learning and teaching in the pandemic to bring, to bring together, together the best of what we learned over the last few years. years. From, the From the perspective, perspective of the three conference themes, themes he, looks he looks at where academics, academics and universities excelled, where they, excelled, where they, where they struggled, struggled, and where they, they adopted new practices, practices that may that have a more lasting impact. impact. He summarises these into ten, ten core lessons we learned about learning and teaching during the pandemic. Three challenges facing us as we leverage these into a better new normal, and three concrete opportunities for action we can take to facilitate improvements in teaching and learning based on these lessons. So again, thank you for joining us, Stephen, and I'll hand over to you now. Oops. Thank you very much, and sorry about the short delay. I was <laughs> unmuting. Um, it's funny how, you know, yeah, it, after years of doing this online, um, I still have that issue too. And I can't tell you how many times I've jumped into a conversation on mute. Um, so thank you everyone for welcoming me here. Um, just so that you know, um, I'm using something called open uh, broadcasting systems. Uh, as my tool of choice and the reason why is it lets me do stuff like this um, so that well, that's not what I meant um, right like this so that you know I look like a professional TV monitor uh, although as you can see from my office I'm definitely not professional here and I, I think that's a bit better and more authentic that's just my personal view uh, sorry about the bright lights as you can see I've got uh, an Amazon box trying to block the light, but we're having brilliant sunshine today. Um, for those of you in the UK, that's when the clouds go away and you get, uh, it's, it's kind of like, well, they call it sky blue in the sky. And then there's this big yellow orb that we call the sun. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, today's talk's called learning and teaching in pandemic opportunities, challenges, and lessons learned, and I've made all kinds of promises. Uh, I see we're getting rain there. Yeah, that, that's the that's the, the Britain I know. Um, this is what it was like here yesterday, in fact. I was out on a bike ride. Um, and uh, if you're wondering, that crop is soybeans. So if you wonder where your soybeans come from, there it is. Anyhow, I've made all kinds of promises for my talk today. Um, so, um, 
I'm going to go through reasonably quickly, although I do want to welcome you, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, to indicate if you have a comment or a question or anything like that, I'm happy to take them. So I wanted to focus on the uh, three conference themes to begin. They asked me to do, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, 10 lessons learned, three this, three that, and the three conference themes. And I thought, okay, I could do it in a grid, uh, but that gives me a grid <laughs> of something like 39 items less than a minute each no um so i'm going to look at the conference themes first and then i'm going to consider these other points from the perspective of the conference themes another thing just you know like house, housekeeping uh i tend to forget where my camera is for the longest time my camera was over here and so i'm going to constantly be looking back here i think i'm looking at the camera but i'm not all right. You'd never know I've been doing this for a long time, would you? The three themes, active collaborative learning, teaching technology in the pandemic, everyday scholarship, and then being together while apart, sustaining learning communities. So it gives us kind of a picture of collaborative scholarship communities. Um, so what does that mean? I always, you know, I, I always question these conference themes. So we have this idea of collaborative, um, and, and we always want to be collaborative. My first question I always ask when I'm thinking of the word collaboration is, are we really working together toward common outcomes? Because that's what collaboration typically means. A lot of the time when people talk about collaboration what they mean is something like cooperation we're working together we're sharing resources but you have your objective i have my objective uh you know so we're not necessarily working toward the same aim and that's an important theme that i think we need to keep in mind now sometimes by collaboration Really, we just mean better communication, better ways of interacting with each other using tools and technology like this technology here. Um, and sometimes we talk about, you know, the different modes, whether we're having conferences, whether we're having video conferences like this, etc. Um, oops, that's not so good. <laughs> There we go. You'd think I'm better at this, but no, I'm not better at this. Let's move that over here. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, every time I, I learn a little bit about how I'm doing this. Um, it also mentioned active collaborative learning. And, and so I wonder, what do we mean by active? I mean, different people have different perspectives. Do we mean just pushing buttons or do we mean playing games? There was a, uh, a tilt fringe thing all about um, games and learning. We'll come back to that. Do we mean creating? Do we mean competing, finding? So many different ways of being active. And I think one of the puzzles is how do we sort between the things that are really active and the things that are just we call them active but they're they're sort of not really active um now we move to scholarship and you know everyday scholarship of digital tools and technologies this is from another one of the alt fringe presentations uh what is teaching uh I would ask, you know, uh, is teaching, is this teaching, am I teaching here? Um, or should we say teaching is dead? Um, and really all we mean is a mentor, guide, and facilitator. Um, what is teaching? Is it conveying information? Is it setting up an environment? Uh, what is teaching? Do we keep the formal classroom? A lot of people think of moving online as you know just taking everything we're doing and putting it on a computer is that the way to look at it um it's not clear to me yes you'll have access to these slides definitely um you don't have access to them at this exact moment however because i haven't uploaded them so they only exist on my computer um 
but I'll make them bigger for you. Uh, is this, and this, this came up, yeah, no, okay. This came up as well in one of the uh, alt fringe events, um, quoting uh, George Koros, technology is not the learning medium, or sorry, is not the learning outcome. It is a medium, it is a tool, and learning has to be platform agnostic. Is this true? I don't think it's true. And the reason why I don't think it's true, and I think we saw this during the pandemic, um, is that the things that we can do online are very different from the things that we can do in a classroom. Uh, the affordances are different. The ways of interacting are different. Uh, the kinds of activities are different. So. I don't, and, and therefore the learning outcomes are different. So I, I don't think it's simply about doing the same thing using different tools. That's like doing the same thing with a hammer as you would do with a wrench. That makes no sense to me. Um, even, you know, the, the concept of teaching, um, does there have to be a learning object? Here's uh, from the, the game presentation. Um, Shish Meld talked about serious games and the idea of using the game to teach rather than just play the game. And I ask, do, you know, do we always have to have this learning objective in what we're doing? Uh, if you look at you know, what the game actually produces, it produces cohesion, cooperation, uh, it produces uh, perception, perception skills, etc. It'll be a different thing for each different person playing the game. I play games just for the fun of playing the game. But in playing the game, I may learn something. Darts. Have you ever played darts? How many people have learned to do multiplication playing darts? Now, the point of darts isn't to teach multiplication, but it certainly works. This is good early years discussion. Play for play's sake. Exactly. Um, and, you know, even if we take this a step further, the there, there one game that was introduced was called Entrepoly. Uh, I guess uh, a portmanteau of entrepreneur and uh, monopoly. And the idea is to encourage people to be entrepreneurs. And, you know, I wonder sometimes if we put the objective into the game, or even the objective into the learning, whether you know we cross that fine line between teaching and propaganda. Is it right to teach everybody to be entrepreneurs? Uh, it's not clear to me that it is. Some, sure, for people who like that, but communities. Always a big word in education, but, but a word that we don't think about enough. Um, who's in our community? Who's not in our community? Think about our learning institutions. There was a study that came out in Canada just recently. Uh, it was quoted by Tony Bates. And it surveyed uh, uh, lessons learned about the pandemic um, from university boards and administrators. And at the, it, was a, it was a list of concerns that they had. At the bottom of the list of concerns were things like accessibility and learning outcomes. Uh, and they were much more worried about financial resources, uh, attracting students, things like that. Uh, as Bates commented, the most pressing concerns of students and teachers would probably be very different. And we need to understand, even in our community, our community isn't one undifferentiated whole. It's a community of communities. And in society at large, there are communities inside our community, communities outside our community. You know, it's not just one big thing. And, you know, sometimes we think of ourselves as being the community. I'm making hand gestures here. Um, uh, <laughs> Sometimes we think of ourselves as the community, but almost certainly we're not. I see this a lot in open education. There are five distinct communities that I can think of 
dedicated to open education that say we are the community for open education or there's conference organizers saying we want to convene the open education community and no that's not right because they are not the community there are many different communities how do they talk to each other do they agree probably not uh, another issue is whether we can create community and this is something educators love to do is create community uh, in in the case of this conference we use the term sustaining learning community but presumably that's the community that we created I'm not sure we can create community um, I'm of the view that communities are, are kind of organic uh, they grow they grow for different reasons and that as educators what we really want to do is be able to tap into different communities I, I ran I'm sorry for using your conference as an experiment but I ran a little experiment um, uh, unsolicited I put in a question into the um, MS Teams area asking simply what did you learn during the pandemic and there were about 600 and some odd people uh, attending the conference I'm not sure how many people are watching this keynote uh, but I got I, I think it was like six or seven responses now that's not unusual um, I hate to say it but it's true it's not unusual uh, the uh, communities that get created especially things like teams and that unless you already have a pre-existing community like the staff of an organization or a class of students you've gathered together it's very unlikely you're going to create a community on the fly like that that's why so many conferences like to use Twitter hashtags and I assume there's a Twitter hashtag for this conference as well but it all goes to you know what is the nature of communities how do they form how do they grow uh, how do they communicate with each other so that's the preliminary how am i doing uh, i took way too long in the preliminary but that's because i tend to go off topic so as faculty and instructors and that's the community that i'm talking to here it's never the community that i think about but it's the community we're talking about here. What are we learning? What can we build on? What changes can we make? Here we go. First of all, 10 lessons. Now, I ta I've talked about these 10 lessons before and some of the stuff I've, I've written and talked about online. These are lessons not only that I've personally learned, but these are lessons that I see showing up over and over in the various lessons learned uh, documents that I've been reading in the course of producing my newsletter so it's not just me saying these things um, here's the first lesson this is the most important lesson any change will be hard at first and I think those of you who began to teach online at the beginning of the pandemic um, somebody says is community a byproduct of the activities I think, just as an aside, I think personally, community is consensus. Um, community is created when a, a group of people decide that they're going to come to an agreement by some or another process. So a community is the process of coming together to make a decision. Just my thought. Anyhow, um, it's hard at first. You're going to get stuff like that, like that, like that, when you're trying to do this. Um, you know, any technology, any activity, remember your first game of cricket if you've played cricket. I said cricket instead of baseball because, anyhow, um, it's going to be hard at first. And so was converting to online delivery. So we need to give ourselves some time it gets easier um you know and you know so many people say well 
Yeah, it just feels so unnatural to be doing it online as compared to in the classroom. Well, yeah, not a surprise, right? You spent 20 years in the classroom, you spent a few months online. What would you expect? I feel as comfortable online as I do in front of a classroom because I've been doing it for a long time. Pretty comfortable with the tools, not nearly as comfortable as I'd like to be, but you know, that's the way it goes. Um, and I think that, you know, as, sorry about the pause, I was reading a comment, because they show up. <laughs> They show up and there's a little ding, so I know every time there's one that comes in. So, you know, it takes time. Um, so, this is one of the uh, discussions from the Teams discussion that I, I mentioned. So, Megan de St. Croix is saying, you know, everything takes longer than you expect. Plan and prepare for that. That's true. Uh, offline group work is challenging. Yes, it is until you get used to it. I cut my teeth in online group work playing in multi-user dungeons, uh, doing group coding projects. Never assume past experience with an online platform. That's right. Everybody's coming in at a different stage of awareness. Not everybody has wi reliable Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, Nicola Richards says, I've learned to roll with it. That's probably the main skill that we're learning online. And it's a hard one to learn. In the classroom, and I want you to think about this, in the classroom, you can kind of wing it, right? Do you remember? Remember back then? Um, you know, if you've ever gone into a classroom and you didn't do the full day's preparation, no, I'm sure none of you actually did that but I did because I thought I could get away with it. And you know what? I got away with it. Uh, you come into the classroom, you write out a few notes, what you want to do for this class. You do the class and it actually works. And maybe you did something like, you know, more help for, or more time to talk for the students, you know, get them into a discussion. Me, knowing me, I'd go off into a digression, etc. Well, the lesson here is you can do that online too. You just roll with it. <clears throat> we, we have this idea that things that are in digital media need to be absolutely perfect, but no. Um, look at this. I mean, is the lack of perfection of my presentation really distracting from the presentation? You are supposed to say no here. <laughs> um, Learning is social, is the second lesson. We knew that already. There are even some outcomes that are social, and I don't think we knew so clearly. But now, you know, the, this whole idea that immunity is a community phenomenon, this whole thing that we're all in this together, I don't know if you got that in the UK, we certainly got that here. Um, people would say, well, it's not like we're all in the same boat. It's more like we're all in the same storm. But nonetheless, right, getting out of the storm is a community outcome. Um, so we learn not just individually, but as a community, uh, the community learns and individuals learn. And the way we do that is exchanging ideas, conduct trade, develop networks, etc. cetera. Um, Laura Stinson comments on this, focusing on the Tilt Online community, supporting staff, but also the student community, um, you know, online, I don't want to say we've built community because that's not right. Um, but community grows and it grows online just the same way it grows offline. Uh, it uses different technologies. Some of the characteristics of that community are different, but nonetheless, the social element is there. You don't feel it so much at the start, but it grows and it develops. Uh, Michael Lawlin says, Lawlin? Laughlin? I'm sorry, Michael. Um, talking about the energy produced from a live face-to-face -face session. And, you know, people feel that they've lost something. And I, and I want to talk about this because this is really important because it, I hear so often the comment, you know, uh, you know, 
I feel so alone and isolated when I'm teaching or working online or when I'm studying online. And my thought is, you know, it's, it's kind of sad if your social connections with the world are exclusively with the people you work with or the people you learn with. Um, I found working at home, working alone, that uh, I was still having social connection with family some more often uh, with the community. Uh, we'd go out for hikes every week uh, in different bush around, you know, different forests around here. And we were joking at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, this is our social uh, event, right? We're seeing all kinds of, we were seeing more people going out hiking than we did before the pandemic hit. And I think that's true. Uh, I don't think that we should be depending on work or on learning to create our social interaction with the world. It's nice when it happens, but it shouldn't be essential. Just my view. Um, you know, so there, this is the discussion that came up with um, Elise Wakelin, again in the Fringe, Uh you know, people being geographically distributed and feeling isolated and lacking peer uh, social support. You can build these social support systems online, but really, you know, it, I think that the place to get social support is in your community, in your home, in your town where you live, or, or the, the urban area where you live. And I think that, you know, way back in, the, in prehistory, there was a model that I talked about called the triad model, where the educational institution, um, the educational institution was one part of the triad, the uh, student or learner was the other part of the triad, and then the third part of the triad was the local community. And I think you want all three of these things, I'm trying to draw a triangle, um, you want all three of these things. And the online and distance learning initiatives that I've seen that worked the best were those that worked in the triad. Um, and we've also learned, this is another lesson in the pandemic, that teaching is not a solitary profession. It used to be. Well, we thought it was, but it wasn't really. Even in prehistory, that is, before the pandemic, we needed buildings, we needed maintenance staff, cafeteria workers, admin assistants. It's just professors and instructors ignored them. Okay, that's not nice. But, uh, uh, but, but the point here is there actually were other people involved. Uh, then we went into the classroom and we really did feel alone. But... Now, more than before, we see the need for that support system. And I like to draw the analogy of like when we watch the news. And even in this presentation, I spent time um, with the people involved in the conference setting up. Uh, you know, I, I kept having problems with the green screens and things like that. Um, you know, we need these technical people behind us. My presentation would be a lot better if I had somebody else doing my slides and managing OBS, but whatever. Uh, think of it like the news, though. You see the meteorologist, right? And you see the map. What you don't see is the whole crew of people working together behind the scenes to make it work. So it's not just the one person working solitary anymore. It really is much more of, I don't want to say a team effort, but yeah, it's kind of like a team effort. And related to that, we're learning during the pandemic that we need live events. Not necessarily in-person events. So, you know, we still like them. I went to a football game last week. Yay. Uh, we lost to Boo. Uh, but, but just having these live events, you know, like this conference, we kept doing things like this conference. We didn't can everything into videos and say, okay, that's what we're doing for this year. We're doing stuff live. Why? Well, there's the planning, the stimulation, the anticipation. You know, we kind of get ourselves up for a live event. I know I do. You know, there's 
wake up in the middle of the night before I give a talk and oh no I forgot to put that in the slides etc they provide interaction presence I love getting those comments popping up as I talk I wish I wish I could respond to them better um, but but I love getting that that response right um, live events uh, provide interaction they provide presence now you can't do everything online that you can do in person laura Scoyles talks about language learning online uh you know and talks about some of the things that are hard to hard to gauge like you know quiet reading comprehension etc um but you know you you have to adapt right you can't sit there watching somebody read silently well you could but it would be a terrible live event wouldn't it although i've been watching live streams on TikTok, and some of them are more exciting than that but it's funny you know the existence of live streams on TikTok is evidence of we, we just need this this spontaneity of live events and so we shouldn't expect the live event to completely replace the live classroom that would be a mistake but we can capture a lot of the essence of a live classroom with a live online event uh how is it going to change well here's a a neat thing uh this is uh u.s football or is it sometimes called gridiron uh, not to be confused with football as the rest of the world understands it. They've created, by Dave, I mean some undesignated group of people, have created something called fan-controlled football. Football is very strategy-oriented, right? The, uh, the, t the two sides line up beside each other, and then they have strategy, and they run plays, and, right, and you try to throw the football, and uh, etc., and so what they did in the uh in the uh, fan controlled league is they put all of that into the hands of the fan um the fans watching the event called the plays they would tell the player what play to run uh, they named the teams and team mcteam face was an early leader just so you know but they they decided not to go with that I'm kind personally kind of disappointed and so the fans and the people playing the game are really in this live kind of interaction and then different teams set that up differently um, that's the kind of event that we should be looking for more and more in the future um, you know open media is a part of this and you can't do this live stuff you can't do this interactive stuff without open media uh, you know i think that we're learning about the role open educational resources plays in online learning through this pandemic uh, i saw one comment somewhere about uh you know someone really enjoys creating these oers and and yeah it's kind of a fun thing to do i love creating these slideshows um i'm down down the rabbit hole of imagining whose line is it anyway type lectures oh yeah that's a great idea yeah improv um students like creating open media students people generally create open media all the time who's learning is it anyway yeah um and if you actually if you think about improv right there's a repertoire of tools and strategies and things that the improv actors draw from um you know and uh, you know pick a scene pick a character etc right and just like that in open resources there's a repertoire of of, of images videos etc the, the base for memes um, that people draw from this becomes a common currency and that's the role open media plays it becomes an aid in our interaction rather than some kind of formalized presentation and you know we we need to look at you know what assets and this is tony hurst here asking what assets are really reusable it's the things that are hard to produce 
uh, the things that are hard to get right and the things that somebody might have already done. Um, you know, not whole courses, not books necessarily. Now, it's good to have open courses and open books. I'm doing my own open courses. But in terms of reusability, these granular things that people can grab and use for whatever person, that's the kind of open media that makes this kind of interactive improv kind of learning work. Uh, there was also a presentation from three people, uh, Luke, Carey, and Chris, about devolving their making spaces. And what I found really interesting about that presentation was the way they moved from having a very strong reliance on central facilities, support, and also, I would agree, management, to uh, a kind of devolved, decentralized, democratically run making spaces environment. And I, I think that that changes the nature of instruction changes what people can do and it gives them responsibility and gives them ownership and addresses things like motivation. And I think that this is something that we're learning during the pandemic. If we haven't seen this, we should be looking for this. Quality matters. Another lesson. Yeah, quality matters. Um, one of the big key lessons of the pandemic was the impact of fake news, misinformation, uh, propaganda, advocacy, um, and the response to that developing things like zero knowledge proofs and crypto addressing. So there's this back and forth. Quality isn't guaranteed. Um, not even from the professionals. I'm an example of that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, you can always expect quality from me. Um, you know, quality isn't a given. People need to learn to be able to assess for themselves what counts as quality. The events of the pandemic have shown how bad we are at that and how we need to get that right and socially how important it is to get that right. But Having said that, uh, we can go too far the other way. Um, if we focus simply and solely on quality, um, and you know, here I have in mind people like uh, Michael Feldstein and David Wiley and others who, who really are focused on the existing student body and making sure that their education is high a quality as possible. Uh, you know, that kind of focus can push against other important criteria like accessibility, openness, interactivity, and so on. So there's a two-edged sword here, right? Two-edged, whatever. Uh, you know, we need quality. We need to ensure quality for ourselves, but an over-focus on quality can also lead to bad outcomes. Another lesson that we learned, and of course we knew this, but we didn't know this really, right? Teaching is more than broadcasting. Now, sometimes broadcasting is good. Look at what I'm doing, right? Sometimes, you know, eight hour videos, usually bad, sometimes good. I've put in here, uh, this is uh, the story of Michael the Brave, um, who's a Romanian hero from the Middle Ages, who was, one of the first people who created the United Romania. Have you ever hear of him? Um, probably haven't. I haven't. Uh, actually, I should be pronouncing his name Mikkel. Um, and I watched uh, an hour and a half long video all about this. Um, there are tons of these online, so they're not necessarily bad. I have my own video series that I do, hours and hours of me following instructions or hours and hours of me playing video games. Uh, it's not always bad, but it's more than just this. Um, it's working with and interacting with people who are online. Now, another lesson, reading the room is harder. 
It's funny, at the beginning of the pandemic especially, the phrase reading the room became really popular. And just as an aside, all kinds of new phrases and expressions really became popular once the pandemic hit, as though we had to completely change the way we talked about the world. Reading the room was one of them. Remote learning was another one. Now we're getting things like hybrid or high flex, all kinds of... of, uh, all kinds of different ways of talking about what we're talking about. Um, Reading the room is harder. It's hard for me to know how you all right now are reacting. Um, Do you like this? Do you not like this? I can't see your face. So I'm depending on those little pop-up comments, um, you know, and, uh, if I were really good at what I was doing, I'd be stopping asking for questions or whatever, but um, it's a keynote. So, you know, the format's a bit different. Uh, it needs to be a deliberate practice. It needs to be the sort of thing that you're doing on an ongoing basis. And you're not, this is key, you're not always going to be able to do it in the moment the way you can in a classroom. Um, that's because it's a different medium. So you need to plan more before and after in order to be able to gauge the reaction. Um, I will happily binge watch eight hours of some TV shows and documentaries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, So it's, it's not necessarily bad. We need structure, order, and routines. Um... We did before the pandemic, too, but we could sort of hide that behind the spontaneity of, you know, well, maybe I will go for a coffee this morning or whatever. Um, At home, especially, um, we don't have those externally imposed structure, order, and routines. Um, And we have to impose them on ourselves. Uh, People, and this is something I learned years ago. Uh, because, you know, I work in technology, I work, I deal with change, and new things happening all the time. My work is completely different every single day. And people ask, well, how, how do you manage that? And my answer is simple. Um, I do the same thing every day. Uh, I wake up at the same time. I eat the same breakfast I do. Uh, I do the same thing in the morning. I eat the same lunch every day. I eat the same supper every day. I'm like a cat. Cats love their habits. And we have cats. And if I go off my habit, my cat will remind me, like, I'm five minutes late for lunch. I can't be five minutes late for lunch because my cat will tell me. Um... Professional baseball players who play a 162-game schedule say the same thing, all right? Uh, it's, such a, it's a hard game, and it's such a variable game, and you have good days, you have bad days, and the way you respond to that is you stick to the routine. You set up the routine, you stick to the routine. And so we've learned, or should be learning, that this is what we need to do in a world that is as uncertain and chaotic as we have right now. Stick to the routine, find the things that work for you and stick to that. Cats of the conference. (laughs) It's not just school subjects. Very important lesson. One of the things that we learned during the pandemic is that the impact of schools goes beyond schools. Uh, The impact of academics goes beyond academics, and it works both ways. What happens outside the academic environment enters into the academic environment. Uh, Things that we wouldn't have asked about before, like someone's home bandwidth, or, you know, whether people are living eight people in a house. Well, you know, just wasn't a problem for universities in the past. Now it's a problem. Um, And as well... You know, we look at, you know, in in health, we suddenly realized we had to look after in-home workers, self-employed workers. Um, You know, some of the biggest victims of the pandemic were were people living in retirement homes, which was in this country a disgrace. Uh, These are all people that matter in society. And I think that any of our institutions that are ignoring them aren't fulfilling their responsibility to society. And this is a lesson 
learn not simply by the healthcare system, but by all national uh, infrastructure in a society, including the educational system. What are the challenges? Um, by challenges, I mean problems. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Uh, all right, first challenge is motivation, right? Uh, motivation for ourselves, motivation for our students. Now, this varies depending on, uh, you know, who we are and who our students are. It matters, you know, it's much more of a factor with uh, primary school children than it is with doctoral students, obviously. But, but, but you know, even when I was a doctoral student, I had days, I had months when motivation was a problem. So it, it happens to everyone. And one of the things you learn really early when you're working online is you can't force people to do things. You can't. They will simply log off. Um, or worse, they will stay and become a troll. Uh, so that changes your power dynamic dramatically it changes your power it changes your outcome outlook on life uh it changes your theories of learning uh this is one of these things uh, you know it's it's not obvious at first it only becomes obvious and i think people spend a lot of time fighting it how do i motivate my students right and and i've always thought of as Motivation is trying to get people to do something that they don't want to do. And I think that the best and most direct way of addressing motivation is uh, have people do what they want to do. That means changing the power dynamic. That means changing the relation between teacher and student where the student is there because they want to be. Now that's really hard to do in a system of compulsory education, right? But that's the challenge. That's why it's in the challenge section. Uh, making it easy for them to do the right thing is also important. That is dead on, absolutely right, and really crucial. So we come back to the democratic manufacturing for the uh, 3D printer project, and look what they did giving students independence and confidence in their skills. And then they adapted, they made it easier for them to uh, manage themselves by creating a, a video induction series. Second challenge, people have diverse needs. So much of education is designed for the mainstream. We've learned that this creates built-in systematic discrimination. And we need to take the attitude or the approach that everyone has special needs. Um, Pamela Henderson is indirectly addressing this, but I think she is addressing this when she says something like this. Materials need to be more visually appealing than the ones we might use in the classroom. And then there's a lot of uh, you know, software that can be used to enhance the presentation of documents. Five minutes to go, gotcha. Uh, I agree. That's why I, I, you know, I spend more time on my slides than I do thinking about the. No, that's not. That's not true. Uh, I spend more time thinking about the presentation, but I do spend time thinking about the design of these slides, and what the presentation is going to look like, how I'm going to set it up with different things to make it more interesting and more engaging, and then I go back to just presenting full PowerPoint slides. Um, more likely there's a point where we make it hard to. Yes, that's true. People have diverse needs. Uh, and the flip side of that is inequities harm learning. Again, duh. But, you know, it's something that really people weren't acknowledging until the pandemic hit. School, and this is a really interesting lesson, school mitigated some of the worst inequities, at least in, in this country. Uh, in other countries, not so much. But in this country, you go to school, you'd get your vaccines at school, you get uh, food at school, you'd get reading material at school, access to computers, access to the internet, and the list goes on. Sports, uh, 
you know, the sociality. Um, all of that disappeared when we went online. And even worse, the people who were in need disappeared first. Now, we know how to solve these problems. What we need is the will to solve it. We need to spend the money on things like uh, community broadband, open educational resources, personal support services, etc. Um, you know, and we need to think about how we are addressing inequities in our learning. Um, this is from uh, P.L. Thomas, uh, something that uh, I ran in my newsletter. Uh, you know, moving from this attitude where we say all students must to each student deserves. And this shift is really important because you can't empower people. You can't give them you know, autonomy and responsibility by saying they must do something, no matter how well-intentioned the must is. Um, you know, in that vein, Alt-C, the other Alt-C, uh, came up with uh, this definition of ethics in distance or remote learning. Uh, awareness, professionalism, care, and community and values. Now, I don't have time to look at that in detail. I will look at that in more detail. I'm doing a course on um, ethics, analytics, and the duty of care later on. But look at this and ask yourself, does this promote that? Is this the tool that will promote uh, the redress of inequities in learning? So finally, how to improve. We need to learn how to learn. How many teachers say, well, I can't learn the new technology, I need a class. Uh, I've done sessions on you know, how you can take personal professional development into your own hands. Why? Because you have to. Um, you know, there are so many people where if nobody's there to teach them, they don't try to learn. Uh, this is something we need to change. Uh, mostly, you know, and, and change, I don't mean in other people. I mean in ourselves, right? Learning should be something that we're doing on an ongoing basis every day and not waiting for someone to give us a class. Uh, you know, and when you do this, you become more successful. And as we move online, people become more successful at being able to learn for themselves. This is again the, the way the new technology changes the affordances and changes the outcomes. Um, and, and Pam Henderson talked about, you know, video scribe. I've never heard of video scribe, so here I am learning something as I'm doing this presentation. Um, the other thing we need to do is employ a range of strategies. Uh, there's no one answer. There's no one thing that will work for everyone. So we need to develop what has been called hybrid learning. But the other thing is, don't try to do it all at once. It would be impossible for me to do this presentation with a group of people in the room and all of you and treat all of you fairly and equitably. Someone's going to get ignored. So, and that's a lesson that hasn't been learned yet by our political leaders. Um, so, and think of it as, you know, I mean, think of it as a kit bag. Think of, think of it as, you know, a bunch of things we can pull off the shelf. They're not just tools. They will change what you're saying. The medium really is the message, but, you know, different strategies for different situations. And then finally, and I won't talk much about this because A, there isn't time and B, there isn't time. Um, F assessment needs to be more flexible. We've seen the dysfunctionality of traditional testing. We've seen during the pandemic some of the issues with surveillance and surveillance culture. We need a mechanism of going, of, of circumventing the whole concept of assessment and being able to uh, use our work itself as the assessment method. Maybe I'll call that content-based assessment. I don't know. Anyhow, that's the talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I am one minute late. I'm sorry. Um, and I 
really appreciated the comments. They slowed me down, but I think they made for a better presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for a fascinating talk. And it was really nice to see some audience participation there and be able to engage with the comments. So much appreciated. I'd like to encourage colleagues now, um, with a couple of minutes to go, to please do go on to other sessions that we have running this afternoon. There's still lots more to see. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Um, are you still with us? I am sorry, Kathy. I, I pressed the mic button again just as I was about to speak. Um, I, I just wanted to, to note to, to Stephen and you, if it would be okay, we can stay on. I, I just wanted to thank Stephen and, and to thank you for sharing, Kathy. I'm still here and I'm watching all the messages as they come by, which I really appreciate. So thank you. That was a really interesting conversation and, and presentation, Stephen. Thank you. It clearly hits a lot of. The, the pulse of, of colleagues attending. I think we've had 112 colleagues attending at the maximum, but it held steady at 106. Throughout, so there's never less than 106, which which is quite incredible. I never would have said this years ago, and now I'm used to quoting attendance numbers and, and <laughs> likes and emotions. <laughs> That are circulated, um, but it was it was a really interesting presentation. Thank you. I've always said one of the uh, one of the affordances, one of the benefits of my presentations is that people can leave the room. <laughs> I, 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 I think that, that goes for us all. Yeah. So uh, my, my presentations have the same have the same affordances. I really like the way you integrate it, co what colleagues comments and thoughts throughout the day and, and weave that in. That's really impressive. You must have been up really early this morning. What, what time is it now in Canada, Stephen? It's uh, just approaching 10 a.m. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very early start. start. Thank, thank, thank you for that. that. Um, I think that really rooted what, what you were saying and the key concepts and ideas within the context of, 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 of the conference itself. Will you, itself? Will you be, be able, able to stay for and attend some of the other sessions, sessions that are now coming? Are, are there more sessions still? If so, I certainly the, will. Yeah. Yes, yes, there are. are. So we're running and um, we have two more presentation sessions, sessions so, so sessions five, five and six, six and then we'll uh, have a round table discussion, discussion um, and a one, one on each theme, theme so there'll be three running concurrently okay. and, and um, for, for anyone, anyone who can't um, stay, stay for the round, round table, table myself, myself Lauren, Catherine, Catherine will be offering cool coffee, coffee and chat, chat. <laughs> um, for people who can just drop in for five minutes so um uh, so that, 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 that will be that. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop, stop there because, because um, Cathy, I know you may want to um, move on to other sessions and, and Stephen as well. But thank you, thank you very much, Stephen, once, once again. And we'll be in touch soon about the panel discussion next Friday, yeah. which Cathy which will be on as, as, as well.